Um, as most of you know, I'm Jessica Berman, director of the Drescher Center for the Humanities and professor of English here at UMBC. Um, and we're really delighted to welcome you here this afternoon. We're at the beginning of our Spring 2023 Humanities Forum lecture series. Um, and I just want to alert you to the next event in the series. Um, that will be a virtual event on Wednesday, March 8th at 4 p.m. Um, and in that event, the Department of Gender, Women's, and Sexuality Studies presents their annual Joan Kornman Lecture, Trans for Trans Care, Reflections on the Undocumented Trans Imagination. Um, and in that talk, Alan Palaez Lopez, artist and theorist, will trace the constant and continual rupture that undocumented trans and non-binary subjects in the United States are subjected to and the mechanisms of imagination they employ to rupture the continual logic of empire, gender, and political membership. Um, and to learn more about the other lectures this spring, I encourage you to look at the Dresher Center website, dreschercenter.umbc.edu. Um, and before we turn to our talk today, I want to make a couple of announcements. First, I want to acknowledge that UMBC was established upon the land of the Piscataway and Susquehannock peoples. Over time, citizens of many more indigenous nations have come to reside in this region. And we humbly offer our respects to all past, present, and future indigenous people connected to this place. While we recognize the importance of acknowledging those who came before us, we also know that this is only a small gesture, and we must take action towards the necessary work of repair. This afternoon's event is being recorded and will be made available on the UMBC YouTube page in the next couple of days. And then finally, I want to thank the Initiatives for Identity, Inclusion, and Belonging and the Office of Accessibility and Disability Services for their support of this event. Thank you. Um, and now I'm going to turn to introducing our speaker. Sammy Schock is an Associate Professor of Gender and Women's Studies at University of Wisconsin-Madison. She holds a PhD in Gender Studies from Indiana University and an MFA in Creative Writing from the University of Notre Dame. A prolific and persuasive writer at the intersection of disability, race, and gender studies, Dr. Schock is the author of many academic articles and two books. She writes regularly for more popular websites and publications, and since January 2021, has authored a monthly column called Pleasure Practices with Sammy Schalk. Her first book, Body Minds Reimagined, Disability, Race, and Gender in Black Women's Speculative Fiction, Duke 2018, considers how black writers of speculative fiction, from Octavia Butler to N.K. Jemison, Chantel Madison, and Nalo Hopkinson, help us understand disability from a deeply intersectional black feminist perspective. By using fantasy or being speculative, they help us, quote, envision an alternative world or future uh, for marginalized, and for marginalized people, this can mean imagining a future or alternative space away from oppression or in which relations between currently empowered and disempowered groups are altered or improved. Her second book just out last year, Black Disability Politics, which is available online, scan the QR code on this bag, <laughs> um, draws on archival work on the Black Panther Party and the National Black Women's Health Project, as well as interviews with contemporary black disabled cultural workers to construct a framework for creating and enacting black disability politics. Because black cultural workers have engaged disability as a social and political issue differently than the mainstream, she argues, black disability politics has often been overlooked or misrecognized within both disability studies and black studies. Her book seeks to remedy that oversight by bringing forward the distinctiveness of black disability work. Um, but that overview of Professor Schock's books doesn't quite do justice to the persuasive power and capaciousness of her work. Professor Schock writes with clarity, backed up by research and analysis, but she also writes personally and from the heart. 
At the opening to black disability politics, she invokes her own journey to identifying publicly as disabled as part of her mission to continue what she calls the labor, care, genius, and advocacy of the black disabled activists and cultural workers she chronicles in the book. She calls on her audience not just to recognize the work of those in the past, but to continue it, be transformed by it, and build on it to make change. I know I found her words more than inspiring, and I hope you all do today as well. Please welcome Professor Sammy Schalk. Good afternoon. Thank you all so much for being here. How's the volume? OK. If that changes at any point, just let me know. Ooh. <laughs> Getting it going. Thank you. Um, thank you for everyone who helped organize um, my visit and for each of you for being here. Uh, my talk is on the screen. Um, and the, the PowerPoint will mostly be to follow along for a couple of quotes and a few images. Um, but if watching the screen is not for you, you won't miss a whole lot if you're not going to be looking at the screen. On May 7th, 1977, the cover of the cover story of the Black Panther, the weekly newspaper of the, of the Black Panther Party read, handicapped wind demands and hue occupation on the screen here. The page includes three images. The first photo features two black men, a wheelchair user, Brad Lomax, L-O-M-A-X, and his fellow Panther member, Chuck Jackson, J-A-C-K-S-O-N, who stands behind Brad's chair. The second image is of a blind black man named Dennis Billups, B-I-L-L-U-P-S, holding up a protest sign that says, you don't have to see to know. And the third picture is of a crowd of, of people of various races outside of a building with a wheelchair user in the center of the frame. Cover stories are reserved for the most important or pressing news of a particular moment. The choice to place a disability activist win on the cover of a black activist newspaper is undeniably symbolic of the party's belief that the success of the Hue occupation, now more commonly referred to as the 504 sit-in or the 504 demonstration, was not merely important news, but news relevant and connected to the Panthers' own anti-racist, anti-capitalist, and anti-imperialist work. The placement of the success of the 504 demonstration on the cover of the Black Panther is in many ways the height of disability politics within the Black Panther Party. It is the most explicit and symbolically significant moment of coalition and solidarity with disabled people in the entirety of the paper's publication between 1967 and 1980, and thus provides the launching point for this talk. In most scholarly accounts of the 504 demonstration, the role of the Panthers is relegated to brief mentions that the party provided food throughout the 25-day occupation of the San Francisco Health, Education, and Welfare, Hue, regional office. Though several scholars of the Black Panther Party have written about the party's community survival programs and health activism in the 1970s, no Panther scholarship discusses their involvement in the 504 sit-in. Only Susan Schweik's Lomax's Matrix provides extensive scholarly engagement with this history. Though recent publications by disability activists who were at the sit-in and the Longmore Institute's Patient No More exhibit on the 504 demonstration have added new details on the role of the BPP as well. My talk builds upon this work to further assess the BPP's engagement with the 504 sit-in, arguing that the Panther supported the demonstration because disability rights and anti-ableism fit within their existing revolutionary ideology, even as disability was rarely an explicit part of the party's liberation agenda.
So my talk today comes from my second book titled Black Disability Politics, which was published open access last year. Um, so you can scan this QR code. Also, I think there were some postcards handed out that have the QR code that you can scan or hand to a friend to scan. Um, I paid Duke University Press $20,000 to make this happen. So please <laughs> read it and send it to people. So again, it's free um, to download and read for anyone who has access to the internet. It's also available to purchase in physical form, um, an ebook, and we are working on an audiobook. The book analyzes how issues of disability, broadly construed, have been and continue to be incorporated into black activism in the post-civil rights era, from the 1970s to the present. In what follows, I will lay out the framework of black disability politics that I discuss in the book, then provide a historical overview of the Black Panther Party and the 504 sit-in, followed finally by an analysis of the multiple ways that the BPP was involved in the demonstration, emphasizing how they rhetorically positioned disability rights in relationship to their larger activist goals and ideology. I use the Panthers, part, the Panthers own explanation of their involvement primarily via the Black Panther newspaper to argue that the black disability politics were an integrative part of their revolutionary agenda and to support my book's larger goal of demonstrating the different ways that black activists have engaged with disability as a political concern. So what are black disability politics? First, I define disability politics generally as an engagement with disability as a social and political rather than individual and medical concern. Black disability politics then are anti-ableist arguments and actions performed by black cultural workers which address disability within the context of anti-black racism. Black disability politics are often performed in solidarity with disabled people writ large but the articulation and enactment of black disability politics does not necessarily center traditional disability rights language and approaches such as disability identity and pride or civil rights inclusion. This book therefore seeks to identify and analyze examples of black disability politics in order to correct the frequent overlooking and misrecognition that has typically occurred in scholarly evaluations of disability in black activism. My time period for this work spans the 1970s to the 2010s, focusing on black disability politics that were articulated and enacted alongside or in the wake of the contemporary disability rights movement. In addition to the chapter that I'll talk about or excerpt from today on the Black Panther Party's involvement in the 504 sit-in, the book also has another chapter on the Panthers' work against psychiatric abuse and two chapters on the National Black Women's Health Project. These organizations are the book's main historical examples and I rely on ex existing scholarship and archival data, particularly the publications of these two groups, to develop my arguments. Additionally, the full book has two interlude chapters, which I call praxis interludes, that further um, try to take the lessons from these historical examples into our contemporary activist context. Finally, the last chapter of the book focuses on interviews I performed with black disabled activists in 2019, and those interviews also inform the praxis interludes. So in analyzing the work of the Panthers, the National Black Women's Health Project, and contemporary black disabled activists, I've identified four common qualities of black disability politics. By identifying these qualities, I aim to provide a framework for interpreting articulations and enactments of black disability politics, one which accounts for the distinct ways that black people have experienced, engaged with, and countered the disability system. My hope is that my identification and analysis of the major qualities of black disability politics in my book will, for, will prove useful to scholars researching engagement with disability within black cultural sites of analysis. 
and may be adaptable in form, if not substance, to study how other racialized populations have articulated and enacted their own forms of disability politics. I argue that when black cultural workers engage with disability, their approaches and perspectives tend to be, one, intersectional but race-centered, two, not necessarily based in disability identity or pride, three, contextualized and historicized, and four, holistic and broad. I'll explain each of these briefly. By intersectional but race-centered, I mean that black disability politics always considers the relationship between multiple systems of oppression. But typically, race is the central or motivating analytic rather than disability. By not necessarily based in disability identity or pride, I mean that unlike the mainstream disability rights movement, black disability political work does not rely on one claiming a disability identity or espousing disability pride. And in fact, much disability politics, especially what I study in the book, are performed by black people who would not necessarily refer to themselves as disabled. By contextualized and historicized, I mean that because many black people are disabled by secondary health effects of disease, medical racism, environmental racism, racial violence, and state neglect, black disability politics are often articulated and enacted with critical attention to the historical circumstances, events, and legacies which have shaped experiences of disability within black communities. Lastly, by holistic and broad, I mean that first, the work of black disability politics tends to address body minds holistically, not predominantly focused on physical or sensory disabilities as disability studies and disability activism have been historically. This holistic approach consistently includes health, illness, disease, and psychological well-being. I also use holistic and broad to, to describe how black disability political wor work tends to attempt social and political change at the micro and macro levels. Holistic and broad, therefore, refers to both the topic or the content of black disability politics and the methods and the tactics of the work. So, now I've explained this overarching framework of the book, and I'll provide some historical background on the Panthers and the 504 sit-in. The Black Panther Party was a revolutionary, anti-racist, anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist organization started in Oakland, California in 1966 by Huey P. Newton, N-E-W-T-O-N, -E and Bobby Seale, S-E, a L E. The Panthers originally focused the, the bulk of their activities on armed self-defense and patrol of police within black communities, and this is what they're most recognized for, rapidly obtaining national and international membership and influence. By 1968, the party had 20 had offices in 20 cities, and by its membership height and influence. In 1970, 68 cities in the U.S. and abroad had Black Panther Party chapters of varying sizes. In 1969, a year before the height of the Panthers, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover referred to the Black Panther Party as, quote, a violence-prone black extremist group and declared that the party, quote, without question represents the greatest threat to the internal security of the country, end quote. Over the course of several years, the FBI, via its covert counterintelligence program, targeted members and suspected members of the Black Panther Party, men and women alike, for surveillance, harassment, incarceration, and violence with the aim of disrupting and discrediting the organization among the public, its allies, and its members. Despite this explicit and well-documented government suppression of the party, the chaos that it caused within the organization and the chaos that it caused within the organization, the BPP adapted 
and continued its cultural, political, and community work in somewhat smaller, though, in my arguments, nonetheless influential and radical forms until 1982. So this shift in the form and the function of the Black Panther Party was reflected in changes to their 10-point platform, a document which defined the demands, beliefs, and investments of the party. The first version of the BPP's platform was drafted in October 1966. It focused on freedom and, quote, the power to determine the destiny of our black community via calls for full employment, land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace. In March 1972, however, shown here, the platform was revised in two key ways that reflected changes in the ideology and activities of the party. First, Point one was changed to call for the freedom and the power to determine the destiny of our black and all oppressed communities. Second, the 10 points were expanded to include, in addition to land, bread, housing, a call for completely free health care for all black and oppressed people. This later era of the Black Panther Party is when they began to more ar explicitly articulate and enact black disability politics. For the majority of the party's existence from 1967 to 1980, the Black Panther newspaper, their intercommunal news service, served as one of the BPP's main political tools, providing the way to inform and politically educate members while raising money. The Black Panther included a wide range of news stories about injustice done to black, brown, and poor people across the country, from police brutality and unfair legal proceedings to discrimination in employment, housing, and healthcare. So on the screen here are some examples of covers reflecting the BBP's health activism specifically one on sickle cell anemia, one on the Tuskegee experiment, and one about a free ambulance service a chapter in Winston-Salem had started. The 10-point platform was published at the end of almost every issue of the paper. The paper also featured advertisements for Panther programs, political cartoons, educational and theoretical articles on social issues, and international news from other revolutionary anti-imperialist causes. At the height, the party printed 150,000 copies of the Black Panther Weekly with national and international distribution. By the late 1970s, the Black Panther was published around 5,500 copies per week and distributed nationally in major cities such as Los Angeles, Chicago, Detroit, and Milwaukee, but by this period in the party's history, the bulk of the copies were distributed in the Bay Area where the BPP was headquartered. This distribution information about the Black Panther newspaper matters substantially to my arguments about the party because even though by the 1970s, the BPP's on the ground work was almost exclusively happening in the Oakland area, the black disability politics expressed within the paper still had wide reach and influence. It matters that black people and other supporters of the party read about disability rights and disability politics in the Black Panther as being integral and important to widespread liberation and revolution. So a little bit about the 504. The 504 demonstration was a major successful milestone in the disability rights movement. It was a 25-day occupation of the San Francisco Regional Office of the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, during which over 100 protesters refused to leave until the National Hughes Secretary signed into effect regulations for Section 504 of the 1973 Rehabilitation Act. So 
So the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 was the first piece of federal legislation dictating essentially civil rights for disabled people. Section 504 specifically stated that programs receiving federal funds, such as public schools, universities, and hospitals, could not discriminate against or exclude people on the basis of disability. While the Rehabilitation Act was signed by President Nixon in 1973, Section 504 remained ineffective without written published regulations. And so what I mean by this is um, basically they had not defined who counts as disabled and what counts as discrimination. So you can't have a law that's effective. You don't have any definitions for what those things mean. So they were waiting for that to be solidified. After years of delays, right, we're in 1977. The act was signed in 1973. Disability rights activists nationwide organize as the American Coalition of Citizens with Disabilities to agitate for official regulations to finally be drafted and approved. When the newly inaugurated Jimmy Carter took office, his few officials attempted to create different regulation than those that were drafted under Ford. In response, the American Coalitions of Citizens with Disabilities warned that if the regulations were not signed as is, the organization would stage sit-ins at Hugh offices across the country in April 1977. While protests in Atlanta, Boston, Chicago, Denver, Los Angeles, New York, Philadelphia, and Seattle lasted for a few hours, and a relatively large protest in Washington, D.C. lasted just over a day, the protests in San Francisco continued for weeks, thanks to the careful planning and organizing by disabled activists in the Bay Area. The occupation of the Hugh Building in San Francisco garnered extensive local and national news coverage and has taken on legendary status within the disability history and disability activist communities for its innovation and power. The Black Panthers were involved with the 504 demonstration from start to finish, participating via the most commonly cited activity of providing daily food deliveries, as well as sending representatives to give speeches, putting out a press release endorsement, supporting two members on the inside with their roles in the protest, and publishing numerous articles in the Black Panther. So I will discuss each of these activities in turn. We're going to go back. So nearly all accounts of the sit-in note that a major part of its success was due to the extensive coalitional support of other organizations. This support came in the form of volunteers, donations, and endorsements from a variety of activist groups and organizations focused not only on disability rights, but also gay rights organizations, women's liberation, civil rights, and more. Organizers of the 504 demonstration secured the support in the planning stages of the protest and expanded their reach throughout the duration of the sit-in. While the Black Panther Party was not listed as part of the Emergency 504 Coalition in the first press release by protest organizers, according to Holin, H-O-L-L-Y-N-N, Delil, D-L-I-L, who acted as insider photographer and press for the protest, BPP member Ellis White, spoke at a rally on the first day of the demonstration. White is quoted as saying, as later saying, and the quote is on the screen, it's a little bit longer, quote, we've always been involved. We've had reps here from the beginning. The issue is self-determination, more human rights, whether handicapped people have a right to survive. Whatever they do to ensure survival, we support. Califano threw drug addicts and alcoholics out of the handicap group. They belong to. The issue is money. It's in keeping with our principles, survival. 
Here, White insists not only upon the early involvement of the, of the Panthers in the 504 demonstration, but also how their involvement was directly in line with the party's principles. That is, their 10-point platform, which first and foremost called for the freedom and self-determination for black and all oppressed communities. The Black Panther Party understood disabled people, along with other people of color, people in poverty, women and gays and lesbians, to be fellow oppressed members of society who had to fight for survival in a racist, ableist, capitalist system. The BPP's solidarity with disabled people in general and the 504 protesters specifically is further articulated in their April 8, 1977 press release written and delivered by Michael Fultz, F-U-L-T-Z, editor of The Black Panther. The statement reads, again on the screen, longer quote here, quote, Along with all fair and good thinking people, the Black Panther Party gives its full support to Section 504 of the 1973 Rehab Rehabilitation Act and calls for President Carter and Hugh Secretary Califano to sign guidelines for its implementation as negotiated and agreed to on January 21 of this year. The issue here is human rights, rights of meaningful employment, of education, of basic human survival, of an oppressed minority, the disabled and handicapped. Further, we deploy, we deplore the treatment accorded to the occupants of the fourth floor and join with them in full solidarity. Like White's statement, the party's official public endorsement here also emphasizes human rights, survival, and solidarity among oppressed groups. The BPP's role, however, was not limited to being a supporter in name alone. They also contributed in key material ways. First, two members of the party, Brad Lomax, L-O-M-A-X, and Chuck Jackson, the disabled and non-disabled black men featured on the May 7th cover at the beginning of this talk, were on the inside of, as part of the sit-in and also acted as representative delegates to DC for the 504 Coalition. As a disabled member of the Black Panther Party, Brad Lomax worked to incorporate disability politics into the efforts of the party. So on the screen here is a picture of Brad Lomax with two other members of the Black Panther Party, <coughs> two black women, um, and I like to share this, this is not from the sit-in, but we don't have very many pictures of Brad Lomax that are like publicly available, so I like to share what we have. So as a rank and file member of the party, Lomax's work still had to align with the goals and ideologies of the Panthers. In an interview, former BPP leader Elaine Brown asserts that Lomax's participation in the 504 demonstration and his work at the Center for Independent Living was considered part of his work for the party. Brown elaborates that while Brad Lomax, who became a wheelchair user after becoming a member of the party, and Ed Roberts, leader of the Center for Independent Living, brought awareness of disability rights to the Panthers, the Panthers' existing ideological position of focusing on systemic change for all marginalized groups meant that further transforming their thinking to include disability politics, according to Brown, was, quote, not hard. Brown states that soon after being made aware of disability politics, the party ordered all of their buildings to install wheelchair access ramps. This is an example, therefore, of the key role that multiply marginalized individuals play in acting as a bridge between groups. Indeed, Brad Lomax was an essential figure whose multiply marginalized identities undoubtedly fostered the BPP support of the 504 sit-in. But that support could not have occurred without the existing revolutionary ideology that undergirded all of the Panthers' work. This is not to dismiss Lomax's important historical role, but rather to acknowledge that the BPP's disability politics did not start, 
end or rest entirely on the shoulders of one individual. As most accounts of the Panthers' involvement of the demonstration state, the Panthers also contributed materially by donating food. More specifically, once it became clear that the protest was going to continue beyond a day or two, the party began bringing daily hot dinners such as fried chicken or meatloaf. The party also, according to Brown, brought in mobile showers for the protesters and supplied a form of security. While the exact form of this security is unclear, it is apparent that members of the party, familiar with the tactics of federal agencies and the police, ensured that supplies got through the door. For example, one Black Panther article up here stated that more than a week into the sit-in, quote, with all incoming telephone service abruptly cut off and all food entry denied, Panther members saw to it that a sympathetic guard discreetly allowed the breakfast food they had brought upstairs to the demonstrators. Similarly, in her memoir, Corbett O'Toole, a protester at this event, writes, quote, I happened to be in the lobby the first night that the Black Panthers brought us dinner. The FBI blocked them and told them to leave. The Panthers, being extremely sophisticated about how to manage police interactions, merely informed the FBI that they would be bringing dinner every night of the occupation. They would bring the food, they would set it up, and they would leave. If the FBI prevented them from doing that, they would go back to Oakland and bring more Panthers until the food got delivered to the protesters. The FBI soon backed down. The material support provided by the Panthers in the form of members on the inside, food and supplies, was essential to the longevity of the protest. But perhaps most importantly for the historical record is the extensive coverage of the demonstration that the party provided in their newspaper. The Black Panther provided the most national coverage of the 504 protest. Only a local paper, the San Francisco Chronicle, covered it more often. The party published 10 articles and announcements of varying lengths about the demonstration between April 16th and, and July 7th, 1977. After the demonstration ended, the 504 sit-in was mentioned an additional eight times in the paper in related stories, often those including protesters doing additional political work later on. <coughs> the Panther coverage of the demonstration is significant because it meant that thousands of black people were being informed of disability rights in a way that framed disability politics as directly connected to black community concerns as a part of a larger radical agenda for freedom for all oppressed communities. The impact of a major black activist organization directly supporting and increasing awareness of disability rights among black Americans cannot be directly calculated. The national distribution of the Black Panthers coverage of the 504 sit-in disrupts the common narrative that people of color have primarily distanced themselves from disability and illustrates at least one way that black activists embraced and understood disability politics as a necessary interrelated part of collective liberation for all. The articles of the Black Panther portrayed the sit-in as an important and necessary act, calling it, quote, a powerful and significant protest for human and civil rights of handicapped and disabled people. The rhetoric in the paper makes clear the connections between disability politics being enacted at the sit-in and the work that the Panthers was already doing to increase the freedoms of oppressed people. In the first article on the demonstration, for example, the paper noted that, quote, despite stereotypes and stigmas very much real and alive, protesters have embarked upon a serious drive to control and transform the oppressive conditions of their lives. This emphasis on oppression, stereotypes, stigma, 
and other sociopolitical concerns presented readers with a social model of disability that paralleled the BPP's own understanding of race and class oppressions. For example, in line with the Black Panther's critique of the federal government, the newspaper highlighted how the Ford and Carter administration's failures to follow through with implementing 504 regulations. Unlike other nationally distributed newspapers, which often mentioned 504 regulation implementation costs and resistance rationales alongside coverage of the protest, the Black Panther focused on rights, access, and empowerment. The one time that the Panther or the paper did discuss the cost of mandating accessibility, it was in order to critique a cost benefit model of decision making. The editorial article sarcastically asked, quote, how much will it cost us for you people to have your human rights? They then went on to detail the estimated costs alongside the profits that, quote, newly employed disabled people will add to the gross national product. The article estimates that, quote, to allow 35 million Americans to have an equal access, barrier-free environment necessary to live full and decent lives will cost a little over eight and a half cents per disabled person. The editorial continues by stating, quote, how much? Well, from the human point of view, a great deal more than the racists and reactionaries are willing to give up without a fight, end quote. Here, the party makes direct connections between the operation of racism and ableism in ways that do not seek to compete or compare, but rather connect. A common concern with how marginalized groups discuss, quote, other forms of oppression is that those who are multiply marginalized are sometimes erased from the conversation. In the case of the Black Panthers coverage of the 504 sit-in, however, black disabled people and disabled people of color were prioritized. In addition to the direct involvement of black disabled Panther, Brad Lomax, the paper published an interview with Dennis Billups, the blind black man featured on the May 7th cover. And this is another photo of Dennis Billups um, from this interview. So in this interview, Phillips and Billups encourages his, quote, brothers and sisters that are black and that are handicapped to get out there. We need you. Come here. We need you. Wherever you are, we need you, end quote. The interview with Billups was edited, so the choice of what to include is purposeful. It is particularly important that the editors included the following statement from Billups, quote, I'm not a member of the Black Panther Party. I'd like to join the Black Panther Party. I am a member of the Black Panther Party as far as my own initiative and soul is concerned. They have fed us, they have given us respect, they have treated us as human beings." End quote. So this quote not only reflects the BPP in a positive light, emphasizing their coalitional work, but it also suggests that the party wanted to highlight the potential for more black disabled involvement and inclusion in their work via Billups statement. Additionally, this interview with Billups and a later interview with Lomax together acknowledge the particularity of the lives of black disabled people and other disabled people of color. So a decade before the coining of the term intersectionality, Brad Lomax referred to being black and disabled as, quote, multi-disabilities. Well, in another article on the congressional hearings at the San Francisco Hugh office, the Black Panther included mention of a panel of four people, quote, all of whom eloquently expressed the double whammy experienced by handicapped minorities. The choice to include explicit representations of disabled people of color demonstrates the BPP's commitment to intersectional thinking before intersectional was a word. All of this is not to say, however, that there was no ableism within the party or within its representations of disabled people. 
The Black Panthers' coverage of the 504 demonstration occasionally used ableist language, such as describing the protest as inspiring or most poignant, while also repeatedly referring to Brad Lomax as being victimized by multiple sclerosis. This language, Schweik argues, reveals, quote, a general lack of disability consciousness within the BPP. And this is because it highlights that the Panthers were generally maybe not aware of how language is being used and transformed within disability rights communities, even as they supported the work emerging from disabled activists. That said, within the overall rhetoric used in articles about the sit-in, the language leans towards quite progressive for its time, such as using both handicapped and, dis and disabled as descriptors in a moment where we were starting to make that transition within the community. Further, the intent was still predominantly aligned with a disability rights approach rather than a medical or charity model of disability that words like inspiring and victim might suggest. Of course, intention alone cannot be the sole basis for assessing ableist or other oppressive language. Oppression, discrimination, and harm can occur regardless of intention. Nonetheless, when analyzing potentially ableist language among people attempting to work in solidarity with disability communities, but who do not yet know the quote, right language, there is utilitarian political value in reading closely and in context, including the intention of the overall text and the frequency, severity, and style of use of potentially ableist language. In the case of the Black Panther, inspiring was almost always used in conjunction with another adjective, such as inspiring and powerful protest, tremendous inspiring victory, or spectacularly, spectacular and inspiring victory, which, while not completely negating the potentially ableist implications, suggests that what was inspiring was the protest length power and success more than merely the fact that it was done by disabled people. Importantly, the words inspiring and inspiration were never used to describe a disabled person, but rather it was used exclusively in reference to the protest, the victory, and once to the fact that the black civil rights song, We Shall Overcome, was used as, quote, an unofficial theme song and source of hope and inspiration by the protesters. Reading the use of inspiring and inspiration in these specific contexts then, and within the larger scope of the BPP's involvement in the 504 demonstration, I would not consider the use of these words, inspiring and inspiration, to be ableist though I would consider the repeated reference to Lomax as a victim of his multiple sclerosis representative of latent ableist beliefs, even as Lopax was supported and respected as a member of the party. And we can hold that contradiction. Taken as a whole then, the Black Panther was perhaps imperfect in its execution but the party strongly supported the 504 demonstration in material and ideological ways because of their existing revolutionary agenda seeking freedom and self-determination for all oppressed people. The BPP's support of the demonstration in the form of public endorsements, members on the inside, delivery of food and supplies, and extensive coverage in their newspaper is representative of how the Panthers' ideology included space for disability politics. The success of the 504 sit-in depended upon a number of factors. The planning, tenacity, and creativity of the protesters, the extensive media coverage which put pressure on politicians, even ironically, the ableism of the employees at the Hugh office who deeply underestimated the resolve and capabilities of disabled protesters, notoriously patronizing them on the first day by serving punch and cookies. The occupation could not have lasted as long and safely as it did, however, without the extended network of supportive groups and organizations like the Black Panther Party. 
Schweik argues that this support is often framed as coming from other activist groups in a way that erases the connections and overlaps between social justice organizations and individual identities. Taking an expansive approach, an, an expansive approach to identifying and analyzing black disability politics addresses this potential erasure. In regard to the Black Panther Party specifically, understanding their enactments of black disability politics requires looking beyond the singular, though important moment of the 504 demonstration toward the party's additional disability politics or additional engagement with disability politics. As I said at the beginning, black disability politics are often enacted within or alongside other not disability exclusive concerns in specific relationship to race and class. This is apparent, for example, in the Black Panthers health activism, where they had free clinics, awareness raising ad and testing campaigns for sickle cell anemia, as well as the Panthers' collaboration with mental disability and MAD activist groups in protesting the return of psychosurgery, which I talk about in the second chapter of the book. Indeed, black activism within and against the medical and psychiatric industrial complexes is perhaps the most obvious location within which to locate black disability politics, as the medical industrial complex has long been a primary battleground for disabled people. Importantly, however, the power of the disability system and the medical and, and psychiatric industrial complexes extends far beyond the explicit confines of doctor's offices, clinics, and hospitals into law, prisons, media, education, and other cultural arenas in which disability politics may be enacted. We see this, for example, in the party's founding of the Oakland Community School, which educated black children who were deemed uneducable by the public school system, as well as the Black Panthers newspaper coverage of a lawsuit against California public schools usage of a racist IQ test for special education placement, which was overplacing black children in these classrooms. While none of these issues or actions were exclusively framed as disability issues by the party, their involvement and attention to disability and health as racialized political concerns demonstrates that in order to understand black disability politics, disability studies and black studies scholars must expand our understanding beyond the framework of disability rights alone. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for coming. take questions and we have a microphone so we hope um, if you have questions from the audience that you will use it. Um, Courtney, do you want to start with the question? We have a question from uh, a remote viewer. Great. So, yeah. This is from a faculty member. Um, she says uh, she's interested in your thoughts about how disability justice can help us reimagine pedagogy and research during ongoing pandemic in a way that supports community building and minimizing harm. Yeah. Um, so disability justice is a, a contemporary activist framework. It is not a academic theoretical framework. Um, and it comes out of the work of disabled people of color, queer disabled people, queer disabled people of color. Um, and it has a variety of principles. I recommend looking at the work of Sins and Valid. They um, really put out this first list of the principles of disability justice, but it includes things like intersectionality, um, valuing and centering the work of those most marginalized in leadership positions, things like that, um, interdependence. And so when I'm thinking about this from like a teaching standpoint, um, I could go on for like a million hours about all the ways I've changed my pedagogy in the course of the pandemic, but I'll give you a couple of them. Um, so one thing I've done is I've gotten rid of my attendance policy entirely. Uh, if you come, you come. If you don't, you don't, because I don't want you to come sick. And that's how attendance policies end up making people come. 
Um, I've also, to discourage people from coming sick to class, I have students take turns um, taking notes. So we take notes on a Google Doc um, so that if you're sick, you know, immediately you can find access to that information without having to track someone down, without having to email me. Um, it's all there, right? Um, so that makes it really easy for folks. And it is an access tool in so many ways because it also means that my students that don't like to talk in class have a way to actively participate and contribute to the classroom environment without necessarily talking. And I count that all the same, whether you're talking, whether you're writing on the board, taking notes, it all counts as your engagement with the course. Um, I also have a now 48 hour no questions asked extension policy. You don't have to tell me, you just take 48 hours because most of the time I'm still grading 48 hours after you've submitted them, so it's okay. Um, and I've also continued to have mask wearing in my classrooms. So the way I've done that is I take a poll at the beginning of the year and I ask folks, you know, what do you need access wise on a, on a variety of levels, but then I ask about mask use and I share that information with students, you know, anonymously, but I say, okay, we have four people in this class who if folks aren't wearing masks, they can't be here. They can't be here. They will have to drop this class. So here's the data, right? Here's the data. None of you said, if I have to wear a mask, I, I will not be in this class anymore because that's an option that I give them. <laughs> it's like, I won't do it. Um, most of them say, I'll wear them if I'm asked to or if there's a reason to. And so I give them that information and out of my own pocket, I make sure that I have masks available in the classroom and it's worked out fine. Um, I have had no problems with mask use in the classroom. Um, I bring my own filter, I have a CO2 monitor, you know, I have a lot of things. Um, but those are some things that I've done like immediately in the classroom and I also have just slashed a lot of the reading. I really cut it down because a lot of my students have long COVID. A lot of my students have brain fog. They are not the same people that they were two, three, four, how, I don't know how long this has been going on at this point, <laughs> like forever ago, you know? Um, our brains are not the same. And so I've really focused on what's the, what do I really want them to get out of this and how can I do that? Can that be broken up by a book and a film? Can that be broken up by a lecture and then a movie in class? Like what can we do to change the pace, to change the way that they're receiving information um, so that they're getting what I want out of it? Um, so those are some things. Research-wise, I'm doing all my interviews virtually. I'm working harder to pay people. I've made my work open access. Um, but yeah, I think we need to listen to the folks that are most impacted in our communities, whether that's within the communities we're researching or on our campus communities, and say, what do you need? And go from there, right? And that's the model that we have in Disability Justice, that we focus on the most marginalized, the most impacted, and they take the leadership in making decisions. Hi. Um, so I guess I wanted to ask, can you hang on? Wait, the microphone, please. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi, I'm Natalia. Hi, thank, thank you for you. coming. Thanks for coming here. Um, so I wanted to ask, now that you talked about post-COVID or whatever, wherever we are now, um, how the 504 has um, evolved or changed or how it's being seen, because now obviously you see like all of these articles, news segments about how schools are just exploding with anger and angst and sadness and depression. So like when you have a school, let's say, that is 50 to 60 percent sad or, <laughs> you know, angry for whatever reason or any, how, how do you see that playing out in terms of also race? Because it, I feel that in the U.S., obviously, you said with the start of the disabilities, uh, disability rights and 504 and IQ tests. So how that is, the two of them, how do those go together? I don't, does that make sense? Because I kind of developed the question as I was Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, we'll see when I answer if I got what you were trying to put down. Sure, we'll find out. Um, so 
uh, I talk about this a lot and sometimes I feel like I'm a downer, but it's, it is the case. So we are living in the middle of a mass disabling event. I, I personally believe that in the very near future, the majority, the vast majority of people will be disabled in some way. Um, and this is not just by COVID, although COVID is a large part of it, um, but because, I mean, in specifically like COVID infections and long COVID, um, but also because of all the other things that have happened around us, right? So we're talking about mental health effects, we're talking about grief, sustained grief, uh, trauma. So I'm thinking especially for folks who um, were on the front lines, who saw a lot of death. Um, you know, I have friends in New York City that had like a refrigeration truck outside their apartment that held dead bodies for weeks. Like that is something that we have not culturally processed. Um, a lot of people also lost folks and didn't get to have our traditional cultural grieving practices, right? So we're talking about mental health effects, grief. Um, we're also talking about folks who put off getting medical care for years um, or had surgeries and things canceled because hospitals were too full. So a lot of folks have put off receiving care and therefore are increasingly disabled as a result. Um, and then we're also continuing to learn about impacts of COVID. So there are studies that say for now uh, that they're finding that children who had COVID are more likely to have diabetes, right? So we have a whole generation of kids that are going to be more disabled now as a result. Um, so how does this relate to race? Um, so we know that folks of color are less likely to have access to quality health care, right? Um, we just are. And so and that's racism and that's also class, right? These are th things that come together. Um, it's the way we're treated inside of these spaces. Um, but I think that we can see that in also some of the long COVID data. So even though um, black folks are no longer, no longer most likely to contract COVID, we are more likely to have long COVID. And that most likely comes from lack of access to quality medical care early on, like access to Paxlovid, um, as well as the inability to take time off work to actually rest and recover. Because you're not considered to have long COVID until three months, if you still have effects three months after you've had COVID. Who has three months to take some time or less time off work? Not very many of us, but definitely not a lot of folks of color, right? So the impact of the pandemic in, as a disabling event is going to have much harder impacts on communities of color. Um, we also saw this in the very early pandemic when it was more common in communities of color and especially folks who lived in multi-generational households um, who still had to work in person um, and who lived in just like crowded urban spaces, right? Who couldn't just go be in their big old backyard hanging out, having, having a good time, right? Um, so we're gonna see the effects of this for a long time. But in terms of the school systems, um, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a theory person, right? So I'm just like, we need to put all of the money into schools and not the military, but that's not gonna happen here. So I don't know, <laughs> I don't know. There just needs to be more resources. Like we need to be prepared. I think about, um, for example, like the Flint water crisis, right? And a lot of folks were talking about how many children um, who experience lead poisoning are likely to have some sort of um, learning disability of some sort. And in the conversations around that, I never heard people say, and now we need to prepare the schools. We need to throw resources into supporting these kids in the schools. It was just like, oh, this is terrible. Look how bad it is, these poor kids. So having the vision of like, how do we actually build and create and sustain disabled futures rather than just saying, sucks for you is is a sh is a shift that we have to start making to actually say this is not ending the effects of this are not ending it will be with us forever forever the young people that are coming up with this now are going to live with the effects of this for their entire lives so what are we doing to set up structures of care and support to allow them to figure out how to fix what we've done because I think our imaginations get limited, and so we need other folks who have less limited imaginations to figure out, you know, besides my solution of just getting rid of the military. Yeah. Um, All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Chuck. 
Uh, my name is Praminda Jacob and I'm in the visual arts department and in the dean's office. Um, my question is actually following uh, on this like, really interesting conversation you're having. And one of the things I'm saying, I'm thinking is, as you were speaking, in response to Natalia's question, is uh, do you think that now, you know, before the whole idea of disability or could be easily kind of moved to just a small group of a lot of population, or even what happened in Flint, did sort of localize it. It was, you know, it was not affecting the whole country, the whole world. Whereas with the pandemic, it's it has affected every uh, place, as you said, and every person. Mm -hmm. So, do you think that that one of the positive effects of that is that this is something that we cannot ignore? It's not something that just happens to certain groups of people, and that we all have to now address it. And like in our own university, um, we've got now a wellness center that we never had before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the Chronicle of Higher Education, I keep seeing almost on a very regular basis about mental health in uh, academia alone. So, and then of course, you know, to the whole society, there's this, uh, this awareness and do you think that that is, uh, it can be in a sort of a ironic way a positive effect of uh, for disability um, studies and disability the movement? Yeah. There was a point where I felt like that was happening, um, especially as we were kind of in that first year of being in online teaching and I just saw so many people adapting and doing virtual events. And I was like, okay, I see the way we're figuring this out. I'm seeing the way that my friends are learning how to like talk about access through COVID access of being like, okay, if I take a rapid and we're outside and this feel good, you know, like having these conversations. But there has been such a, I mean, I, I can only say like capitalist push to just completely forget and ignore that I don't, I'm still challenged to believe that like widespread change is going to happen um, without something pretty dramatic. Um, Cause I think folks are still in denial about the long-term effects of COVID. Um, folks with long COVID are being like gaslit on a regular basis um, inside of the medical industrial complex, you know, told that they need to get psyche valves because there's nothing that we can yet tell. Um, so I think there's ways that folks are still leaning into able-bodiedness to be like, well, I had COVID and I'm fine. I had COVID and I kept going, I went to work, right? So people are able to kind of turn that ableism just in a new way that I'm seeing of being like, well, we did that, but now we don't have to anymore, right? Like at my university, there's almost no online courses anymore, but there are still disabled people. <laughs> there are still disabled people who like can't come to these in-person classes um, where no masks are required. And we have old buildings that have bad ventilation, you know? So the changes that happened are getting chipped away, even down to access to testing, right? We're losing access to quality testing. Um, it's just not free anymore. They tried to make the vaccine not free. I think that they got shamed into not doing that for now. Um, but there's this way that like capitalism and ableism still come back. And so I think we have to remain cognizant, right? We have to remain cognizant of the way that the long-term disabling effects of this pandemic. And again, in all ways, not just specifically related to, did you have COVID? Do you have COVID? Um, it's gonna be with us for a while. We're gonna see it for a while. We won't know. I mean, I just think about the people who are like in the middle of like a war or something. And I'm like, did you know what was happening historically around you? Like, I don't think we're gonna get it until we're not the ones that are looking back at it. Um, but I do think that it has given folks a sense that disability is not just physical and visible, and it is not just elderly folks, old folks, right? Like we see people with long COVID who are 20 years old and who from the front of their, you know, from visually on their body, you can tell not at all. And so I do think that's starting to challenge some people and challenge their understanding of disability. Um, I'll be curious to see how and if um, more places start to understand 
long COVID um, workplace and school accommodations under the ADA, because I think we don't know that yet. We don't understand it yet. There's ways that we can model it after folks with chronic illnesses, um, but we haven't had this many people need these kinds of accommodations. So I think, yeah, we're just in process and I'm watching, I'm just watching and seeing and trying to influence in the places that I can, yeah. Questions over here. Hi, uh, so do you have any thoughts on disability and higher education, specifically in how black students continue to be discriminated against at higher rates in comparison to their peers? And do you have any advice for students seeking to make changes in these environments based on your research? Yeah, um, so I don't know how your accommodations office works, you know, it's different every place, um, but some schools, you know, they really do require you to have um, pretty extensive documentation of a disability to receive accommodations. Um, and that is a barrier for a lot of people for a variety of reasons. Whether they don't want something documented in general, they don't want an official diagnosis label, um, or because they just don't have access to a doctor to receive this diagnosis. Um, I had a student, um, yeah, I had a student at UW who was like, yeah, um, I was supposed to get a, like an autism diagnose, diagnostic test and an ADHD, but I can only afford one. So I just picked one. I just picked one diagnosis to get this year. Maybe next year I can get one, you know, like making these kinds of choices. Um, so really rethinking, like, how do we provide accommodations? Um, how, I mean, I just get frustrated with a lot of my peers and colleagues at their refusal to be flexible in the way they provide accommodations if that person does not have something from the office, right? When I think some of our accommodations could happen informally um, without much stress on us, but because we have this idea of like everyone, disability faker, um, it, and sometimes people have an, antagonist, an anti, antagonistic relationship to their students. Um, they just believe the students are lying. So I want to like, I wish that we could change that approach to be like, if someone is asking for support, it's probably because they need support. Because it's really hard to ask for support in our culture and it is discouraged. So if someone has like stepped up to say, I need something, it's probably because they need it. Um, I also think that line between like need and it would be really useful is also a thing that gets difficult. Um, I think about this for myself as someone who um, has chronic pain. So sometimes I get wheelchair service at the airport. Sometimes I don't, depends on my body, right? But a lot of times it's not about, can I walk that distance? It's if I walk that distance, what am I gonna be like once I actually then leave this airport and go somewhere else? So if I can get support, it's gonna make things easier, even though I don't, need it in the sense of I can do it, but it's gonna cost me so much pain. So where are the, like thinking about those lines, um, yeah, and I think when we think about students of color, so there's that like insurance access to doctors, but also that discouragement of asking for help. Um, I know for me as like a black woman in college, I was like, I can't show any weakness. I have to show that I am a million times better than all these other people. I was on a full ride scholarship with a lot of literally white boys in my dorm that were like, why do you have that and not us? So I, had to, I felt like I had to prove myself and there was no way, no way I was gonna get accommodations and look like I was getting extra whatever. So there's a lot of like destigmatizing of support, recognizing the ways that folks may or may not ask for help. Like how do we tell people that these are available? I've had so many students that didn't even know how to access the resources if they didn't already have like a very active parental involvement. So how do we get that information out there? Those are all things um, that I can think of. And then in terms of creating change, really depends on you know your institution, what that looks like, but students have a lot of power, like more power than I think y'all think you have. Um, because at the end of the day, universities don't want bad press. And if there are a bunch of angry students saying a bunch of angry things all the angry time, that is not good press. And so there's power in that. There is power in that, but it takes coalition building, right? And I think a lot of times disability activism on college campuses is so put on to multiply marginalized disabled people who are disabled and tired and already dealing with so much stuff 
that they burn out super, super fast. And so how building that coalitional support, which is like part of what I hope my book does is like make folks realize that black liberation requires disability justice. Um, that is gonna be part of it, of like when we are calling for institutions to, for example, hire more faculty of color, hire more therapists of color in your wellness center, right? How do we also incorporate more things around disability justice into our calls and demands, um, whether we are explicitly a disabled activism group or not? Yeah. Um, um, I'm not using the mic, sorry. Uh, how do we deal with reactions to asking for accommodations like the ones that you've been talking about? Like, I'm somebody who has long COVID that I've been dealing with, and I'm 21, and people are like, no, you don't. Um, you're not allowed to have that because you're 21. And sometimes even from other students, I see this reaction of like, you talking about disability is getting in the way of our progress and whatever our marginalized um, group is. And how do we get people, I guess, to listen? Um, and to not see asking for accommodations as something that's um, precluding progress for whatever they might need. Yeah. So I'll start with like that precluding progress thing because I think that pitting, uh, pitting oppressed groups against each other is like how <laughs> larger systems win, right? It's like keeping us against one another and believing that there's like only so much. Um, so for me, that's like shifting a scarcity mentality, but it's also about relationship building. I think that a lot of times we stay in our like specific silos and then there's like, you know, the one black disabled person who's like, I'm in both groups and that's it. Um, so actually building like real relationships with people, not just like, hey, can you co-sponsor this event with us, but having conversations with people that like consciousness raising work is so tedious and hard right but it is that is the real work to me um because it takes consciousness reading and shifting for folks and that takes real conversations with people or sharing and sharing resources too right that's another route to say hey can we watch this talk about this um but making really clear that like the things that are being used against you are also being used against us or the things that we want help you in these ways right there are black disabled students, there are Latino disabled students, right? Like we're all, the people that are part of your community are also being impacted by this, even if you specifically are not, um, might be a beginning of that kind of bridge building. In terms of reactions to accommodations, um, it just depends on the way you wanna approach that. You know, with a faculty member, you might not wanna like really go off at your faculty member. Um, but making clear, like, this is what I need. Here is any documentation that I have that I am willing to provide. Um, and really knowing what your rights are very clearly in a way that is just like non-emotional can be helpful. Um, but if you don't have that accommodation, documentation support, then really talking about like, what is possible here? What are you willing to do? What are you willing to not do? Um, and when students, you have like fellow students responding, I mean, yeah, my approach is often to be like, do you wanna see the bag of meds that I carry? Do you want to uh, see this video of me? You know what I mean? Like really being like, do you want to see this and understand this or are you just being an asshole? Um, because you think you know what disability looks like. Um, but yeah, I think sometimes people just need to like have a moment of clicking in their head that like, this is what that looks like. But I do think more and more people are experiencing long COVID and don't even realize that's what they're experiencing. Um, so I've been doing a lot more of sharing of like, here are the kinds of things you might be experiencing that you don't even think has to do with COVID, but it does because it's affecting your brain and your nervous system. Um, and so that has also been helpful in like helping people realize that what it's not like it's just your lungs. I think a lot of people thought that that's what it was, right? It's a respiratory disease, it impacts your lungs, the end. And that is so, so far from what we're seeing is actually the truth. Um, so some of it is just like truly information sharing, um, but I'm sorry that you're experiencing that because I know um, it's really discouraging, especially when it's happening from both your peers and your professors. So I'm sorry you're having that happen. We had another question over there. Hello. 
Um, first, thank you for your work and for your labor. Thank you for your brilliance and your genius that you bring to this and for sharing this with us. Um, I am interested in kind of making a connection between your previous book and this book mm -hmm. um, and how you saw the work of black women, um, especially like thinking about black feminist, black feminism, black feminist thought, and the ways that um, you read that into the speculative fiction that you looked at. I'm wondering about the work of black women as a part of the Black Panther Party um, and in what ways they may have been instrumental in kind of the evolution of the party, um, especially as it concerns to the politics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a hundred percent. And this is definitely it's in the book. So wasn't in this presentation, but it's definitely in the book. Um, so I have some theories. Um, so the, the the part of the Panther, the history of the Panthers that I'm talking about, this particular time, post nineteen seventy, particularly post nineteen seventy two, um, is when the Panther was majority women and majority women led in particular. That gets erased from a lot of the history for a couple of reasons. Um, first is that a lot of Panther history stopped in 1972 because once the main leaders were um, either in exile or in prison or killed, um, many Black Panther scholars are like, and that's the end of the party, even though it kept going, right? Because it wasn't in the same form. It didn't look the same. It didn't look as like sexy, you know what I mean? Like a bunch of people in berets and like guns, like that's a sexy look for an, an activist sexy, you know? Um, it, it was, so it changed, the approach changed, but the approach changed because of the, the COINTELPRO program, right? It was because of the efforts of the FBI to put folks away that they were like, okay. I mean, literally California changed their, their gun laws to keep the Panthers from being able to um, be public with their rifles and shotguns, right, which were the most accessible guns to them by saying that those are not allowed in public anymore, different kinds of guns. Um, so they had to shift. They had to change their tactics because the world shifted around them, right, in response to them specifically. And so we see mostly a lot of women taking leadership roles because so many of the men had been arrested um, or were in exile because they were going to be arrested. Um, and not that black women were not arrested as part of the Panthers. Plenty of black women were, um, but more black women kind of stepped up in terms of leadership roles. So in my opinion, the combination of black women taking most of the leadership roles and then the shift to being much more locally focused in Oakland and doing these community survival programs that looked like food pantry programs, free health clinics, um, the safe walk program to walk elders home, the school program, right? So many Panther scholars considered that era to be not revolutionary work. And to me, it is like the most <laughs> revolutionary work to be like, how do we provide long-term support to our communities? Um, and, you know, Huey Newton, as the like founder of the party said, the community survival programs are the basis of our work because we can't expect people to have political education and political involvement if they are starving, if they don't have homes, if they are struggling with their health, we need to do that first. We need to take care of people first, right? Body and soul is the phrase, like we take care of our people, body and soul. So I think that black, feminist, black feminism highly influenced that work. Um, I think it influenced how they shifted to the community survival programs. I think that focus on children and elders and healthcare, right, care work was largely influenced by black women being like, what we're not going to do anymore is walk around with guns. Instead, we're going to do this other thing. Not that that wasn't important, but here's what we're doing now. Um, we see that especially in the Oakland Community School, I think. Um, where they were so many black children or black panther like parents had their children being harassed by cops as they walked home from school that they were like we need another space to educate our children where they are getting affirming education about themselves as black children um and there are people who like are now adults right who came out of those schools and those spaces and talk about why that was such a foundational experience to be educated among black children by black people um, so I think all of that, all of that work is influenced by black feminist theory. Um, there was a lot of writing that was talking about the role of the black woman and pushing back on this idea of like standing back. Right. Um, so I think that was all there and it shaped the, yeah, it shaped the activities 
And yeah, I can't like prove that every Black Panther scholar is like sexist for things, but I really think that the fact that everyone is like, well, it stopped being revolutionary at this point. And I was like, when the women took over, that's weird. That's weird that that's what you think. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's, it was, it's an important part. Um, so I talk about that in the book, um, the role of black women in the party. Um, and, and then of course the second group that I talk about national black women's health project was like very explicitly black feminist. Thank you for that very generous <laughs> period. And I think we all need to read the book. I think it's very clear. So thank you, but really appreciate this wonderful talk. Thanks, y'all.